Oh. My name is Father John Musser, and welcome to St. Anne's Episcopal Church in Damascus. Uh, I apologize about the tech issue there just now. Thank you so much for this morning, whether you're joining us in person or if you're joining us online for this, our gathering together in the of Epiphany. Our service this morning is Holy right to, and we will prepare now to enter into this time of worship. I to take a moment at your hearts and your minds as we prepare to worship the Lord. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires know. From you no secret are hid. And further magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Together we glory to God in the highest. God, we worship, we give you Lord Jesus Christ, Lamb. For you, Holy One, you alone, are the Lord, you, okay. Jesus Christ, Spirit, glory of God, Father. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things, both in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. 
please be seated for the reading of scripture. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, ha, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See today, see, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to plant and to build. To build and to plant. The word of the Lord. Our psalm today is Psalm 71. We shall read responsibly, responsibly in the half verse. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. In your righteousness, deliver me and set me free. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. Deliver me, my God, from the hand of the wicked. For you are my hope, O Lord God. I have been sustained by you ever since I was born. A reading from Paul's letter to the first church. A reading from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully. For even as I, have, I am fully known, now and now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greater of these, is love. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Jesus began to speak in the synagogue at Nazareth. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might haul him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. This morning I speak to you in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Julie and I have been watching a show on Netflix that has been receiving rave reviews, and so far we have our, ourselves have been completely... Uh, enamored with it. It's called Archive 81, and it's a bit of a kind of dark thriller, horror, supernatural, I, I don't know exactly how you would frame it, um, but it, it's got this captivating power to it. And we find ourselves waiting kind of each day till the evening after Anna goes to bed to watch the next episode. And the reality is that I have had this strong urge to go online, it's been out long enough now, to find the synopsis and figure out what's going on so that I can just resolve this internal anxiety I have about where the show is going. But so far I've been able to manage that urge. We'll see. We have three episodes left. But that... that tension, right, exists for all of us in many forms or fashion, whether it's that great book that we're reading where we want to flip to the last chapter and figure out what happens, or that uh, critical game in the season that we have recorded and we're watching and we want to just kind of fast forward to the end, those final moments to see who actually wins. There's this constant desire we have to just kind of know what the end result is and what the end result is going to be. But in truth, in life, we don't have that ability. So often we live in a more significant way with this 
anxiety, of uncertainty. We want to have that reassurance that things play out exactly as we desire for them to play out. We have this sort of grand vision mapped out in our heads that we want to come to fruition. And sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. But we live with that tension of the unknown. We live with that experience of uncertainty. And it's something that we wrestle with day in and day out, season after season in our lives. And it's that tension of uncertainty that Paul addresses in the latter half of our epistle reading today. It's one of my favorite chapters as a whole in all of Holy Scripture, but this latter part of 1 Corinthians 13 is, in my mind, one of the most profound truths in the New Testament and in the teachings of St. Paul. As we hear him say again, for we know only in part and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide these three. And the greatest of these is love. This love chapter is actually one of the most uh, uh, resourced of all the chapters in the Bible when it comes to our liturgical life. There are many instances in which we find 1 Corinthians 13 popping up because the language of love here, the truth of what St. Paul is communicating is applicable in a number of circumstances and situations in our lives. But oftentimes, when this chapter is read, we don't get this second part. We hear the love language in the first instance speaking in tongues of mortals and angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong. Or, if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. But we miss this second part, that love and a fundamental experience of love brings with it a level of uncertainty, a level of humility, a level of encountering and, in a sense, embracing the unknown. It's a tension. It's a tension. Because we want certainty. We want the certainty of truth. But sometimes that is beyond our grasp. And sometimes we have to live in the tension of the unknown. And the question before us is, how do we live in love as St. Paul is commending while simultaneously living in this tension of uncertainty? What does it mean to live and love in the reality of the unknown? I was reflecting significantly on why it is that we have the pairing that we do today with this gospel lesson and this epistle reading from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. And I think, as I've sat with this and mulled over it, that what we encounter in the response of those in Nazareth is a failure to live in love in the midst of uncertainty and in the midst of unknowing. 
Because Jesus is bringing them a new teaching. Jesus is announcing to them a new reality, a new work that God is doing. And they can't see that. And they can't see that because it is an unknown. It is an uncertainty. And they could, in the one instance, have reacted to that uncertainty with love. But instead, they react with terror, with anger, with frustration. I have to admit, as I was thinking about that, I came up with numerous parallels to our own circumstance that we face today as a world community, as the individual people in the United States, as even the individual people within our own community. Long before COVID, we've experienced this sense of growing uncertainty in the world around us. Things aren't as clear-cut and concrete as they seemed 50 years ago, 25 years ago. The world seems so much more out of kilter today than it has in the past. And the way that we have responded, unfortunately, seems to be more and more significantly a response of terror, of anger, of frustration, and not of love. So how do we live into this? It's a challenge. And I I admittedly will be the first to say that it is a challenge. But it's the teaching, it's the truth of the gospel and of our lesson from St. Paul's epistle that I think we need to hear ever more profoundly and wrestle with ever more deeply today how to live in love in times of uncertainty. You know, last week I talked quite a bit about the Great Migration. And uh, for those of you who either weren't here or weren't able to hear my homily last week, the Great Migration was this incredible experience of movement in the United States in the first half of the 20th century where largely African-American communities and individuals uprooted themselves and moved north to greater opportunities, educational, occupational, otherwise, in cities along the East Coast and the middle part of the United States. And it was life-changing and life-giving for many of those that participated in it. But it was an experience of uncertainty. And as I was preparing for my homily today and thinking about that connection to last week, I was reminded of a couple that I have been great friends with over the years, a couple that taught me something very profound about our own faith experience. This couple who experienced the Great Migration firsthand were two men named Albert and, sorry, Albert and Fred, who I knew from one of the parishes that I served here in Washington a number of years ago. And Albert was from South Carolina. I think Fred was from North Carolina, but they were both Carolinians by birth. And to come up at the very tail end of that great migration period in the mid-60s for college at Howard and had met each other as students at Howard and had gone on each individually to uh, very robust and and life-giving professions in the D.C. area and had been able to accomplish 
some level of success that I think was astounding both to them and to their extended families who could never have conceived of being able to come up out of the circumstances in which they were raised, being, at least for Albert, and I think Fred too, uh, children of sharecroppers and great-grandchildren of enslaved peoples. And to be able to so dramatically come from that experience and have such raging success professionally in this area was astounding. But they also found love in relationship to each other. And being gay men, gay men of color in the middle part of the 20th century, to find that love and a place where they could live it authentically and openly was equally astounding. And yet, there was a complexity to them and to their relationship as well because they were parishioners at one of the most conservative, stalwart conservative parishes in all the diocese of Washington. And so they simultaneously somehow balanced this tension of being faithful Christians in the way in which they felt called to be faithful while being authentically themselves in the relationship that they maintained, being the people of great professional success that they were individually. It was a complicated and complex mix of truths that they held together in whatever kind of complex way that that maintained itself over the many years. And foundationally, as I would talk to them years later, what kept them afloat, what kept them together, what kept them grounded year after year, decade after decade was love. They knew intimately the love that is being communicated in St. Paul's reading from Corinthians today. It wasn't simply a filial love that they had for one another for their family, for their church community. It was this deeper love of God that they shared together, but that they felt in their relationship. That God's love kept them together, kept them grounded, kept them attuned to the work that God was doing in the world. And God blessed them over their many, many years together. God kept them grounded. And God showed them what that love can look like in its many and complex forms. Even as they lived the experience of uncertainty, lived the experience of the uncertainty of being people in color, of color, in a society that in many ways did not support or accept them, being gay men in a society that certainly did not accept them, being unable even to consummate that love together in a official way until the very end of their life together. They lived that tension of but they navigated it through love. And as we hear this reading today, as we come to this time in our life together and discern how we are 
to live into this uncertainty and love. I think we're offered some profound opportunities to step back and reflect on that as a community, as individuals, as an entire world in a great period of uncertainty. When I was just becoming an Episcopalian, my bishop in Arkansas preached this sermon that I still remember to this day, in which he was preaching on the Nicene Creed, and he was commenting, and as some of you may have experienced, commenting on the reality in Arkansas, which I think is true in many parts of our country, where people don't really know who we are as Episcopalians, what the Episcopal Church is about. And he was, he was reflecting on that, and he said, just answer with the Nicene Creed. It's what we profess every Sunday. He said, that's what we're on about. If anyone asks you, who are the Episcopalians, what's the Episcopal Church about? Say, we're about Jesus. We're about the Nicene Creed. We're about these affirmations that we affirm in the Nicene Creed. But more significantly than that, he picked up on the very end of the creed, and he said, we also know where this is headed. This is not some pitched battle in which we don't know the outcome. We know foundationally that Jesus wins out in the end, that God triumphs in the end, and that certainty we can rejoice in and be reaffirmed in and be reassured by. And that's true. But I think I'd be remiss without acknowledging that in these times of great tumult and upheaval, that truth can seem very far away, it can seem very dim, it can seem hard to hold on to. So even as we wrestle in that uncertainty, even as we wrestle to remember that truth, how are we to be together in the midst of that struggle. And the answer we have is love. Even in times of great trial, love. Even in times of unknowing, love. Even when things don't seem to be coming together, love. Love is it. As Bishop Curry is so fond of saying, if it's not about love, it's not about God. Love is our response. Whatever struggles whatever trials, whatever difficulties we face, love is our way forward. And it might be that we are the ones in need of love. It might be that we are the ones who are able to offer it. But either way, in these times of great challenge, truth we hear in today's gospel is that love is what gets us through. And I offer that today for us to reflect upon, to be reassured by, and to be challenged as we think about the ways that we are called to love in the midst of uncertainty. How is it that we can be a loving presence for someone else? How is it that we might need to ask for that love if we are seeking to find it? Love is the answer. 
And before all else, as we heard in last week's reading from 1 Corinthians 12, before all other gifts, before all other talents, before all other ways in which, which we exercise our Christian faith in this world, before everything else comes love. The first place the first word of profession of faith on our lips should be love. Love is foundation. So today as we hear anew, hear afresh these words from Holy Scripture, hear anew the reassurances that God gives us in this liturgy, in this place, in this time of renewal, let us hear love. Let us hear the reassurance of love. And let us recommit to love of ourselves, of one another, of those to whom we are called. And let us leave this place in love and evermore seek after the love that God is giving to us as we live and move and have our being in this world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I ask for your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our bishops Michael and Marianne, for this gathering and for all, for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble, especially Kathleen Baer, Barbara Barlow, the Brandhover family, Ellen Brewer, Kimberly Bronte, T. 
Tatiana Bryant, Joe Currency, Louis Currency, Erin Chirian, Carl Cutright, and Dale Cutright, Azurian Elderman, Jonathan Elderman, Audrey Engstrom, Carol Goodman, Michael Greenstein, Jan Harris, Jeff Hoshiker, Raphael Martins, Carolyn Mills, Craig Mills, Steve Mullen, Ruth Patro, Benjamin Ramney, Bartolomeo Torres, Danilo Torres, Dulce Torres, Victor Torres and the Torres family, the Trosi Groton family, especially Kate and Shay Groton, and John Ward. I ask your prayers for all who are affected by COVID-19 and its variants. More than 362 million cases worldwide. More than 5.6 million deaths worldwide. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of Him. Pray that they may find Him and be found by Him. I ask your prayers for the departed, especially Kathy Gearing, David Goodman, Larry Kojago, Terry Smiley, and Ruth Westphal. Pray for those who have died. O oh God, preserve us from all envy at the good of our neighbor and from every form of jealousy. Teach us to rejoice in what others have and we have not, to delight in what they achieve and we cannot accomplish, to be glad in all that they enjoy and we do not experience. And so fill us daily more completely with love through him in whom you have promised to supply all our needs, our Savior Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, The first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now I invite you all to join with me as we pray our prayers together. For those celebrating anniversaries this week, let us pray. O oh God, you have so consecrated the covenant of marriage that in it is represented the spiritual unity between Christ and his church. Send therefore your blessing upon these your servants that they may so love, honor, and cherish each other in faithfulness and patience in, uh, and their home may be a haven of blessing and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Those celebrating birthdays this week, let us pray together. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up in fall. And in their hearts may thy peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And then our prayer for those who have traveled, will travel, or are traveling. Together we pray. O God, our Heavenly Father, whose glory fills the whole creation and whose presence we find wherever we go, preserve those who travel, surround them with your loving care, protect them from every danger, and bring them in safety to their journey's end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God of peace, you have taught us that in returning and rest we shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be our strength. By the might of your Spirit, fill us to your, we pray, to your presence, where we may be still and know that you are God. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Well, good morning, everyone. Please be seated for just a minute as we have a few announcements. Um, first of all, I just want to say another warm welcome to those of you that are with us in person today. For those of you joining with us digitally, thank you for being with us. If you're visiting for the first time, I would love to get your contact information after the service so that we can be in further contact and uh, talk and learn more about one another. Um, we also have several kind of big key events on the horizon over the next couple of weeks. So I want to uh, flag those for you all really quickly. Um, immediately after today's service at 12.30 p.m., the women of St. Anne's will have their annual meeting over Zoom. Uh, the information for that has been uh, in the newsletter. If you have any questions, you can reach out to Lynn Fleming. Uh, she's here in the service today, so if you have if you're here and have any questions, she can uh, answer those in person after the service. Next week, on uh, February 6th, we will have our annual meeting here at the parish. And what we will do is have our service as per usual at 10 a.m. And then following our service, we'll have a, a few minutes of transitional space, but then we will move into our annual meeting. And for those of you who haven't participated in one before or don't know what I'm talking about, this is our opportunity on a yearly basis to kind of hear what's going on with the church. And as you'll understand or realize, uh, I haven't been here but for a few uh, short weeks at this point, so largely um, the communication and reflection about where we have been will be coming from our vestry leadership and other members of the parish. But I will take an opportunity as rector to share some of my uh, kind of forward-looking vision, what I hope to accomplish in this next year and in the coming years, and kind of talk through some of my aspirations and hopes and dreams for us as a community. And then following uh, next week, February 6th, annual meeting, the following week on February 13th, we have a very exciting opportunity. We won't meet at this time, 10 a.m., like we normally do, but we will meet that Sunday at 4 p.m. right here in this space. Uh, for those of you joining us digitally, we will be broadcasting it as well, so you can participate in either form. But Bishop Marianne Buddy will be with us, and she will be installing me as the rector, uh, which is a uh, sort of specific liturgy that uh, she as bishop performs to uh, kind of officially 
uh, put me into this position that you all have uh, elected me to. Um, and that will be a joyous occasion to be with her to celebrate um, that experience. And then after the service at four, we will have a reception with her uh, in our parish hall. So uh, we'll have some time to uh, be with her and to uh, interact with her in that uh, joyous and celebratory atmosphere. Um, on that note, uh, thinking of Bishop Buddy, I do want to just say one quick word about yesterday. Uh, Deacon Eugene, myself, uh, Pam Brewer, uh, several uh, folks from the church uh, participated in our um, diocesan convention and it all went very well. Uh, I'm very happy to report that we as a whole diocese are on a very strong footing both financially and in terms of the uh, kind of mission and goals and uh, aspirations that we have as an entire diocese. Uh, we have an incredible and profound leader in Bishop Buddy, uh, and she has committed, and I'll, this is the, the kind of key thing I want to tell you about today, and I'll be talking about some more elements of the diocese uh, and diocesan work in the coming weeks, but she has committed, uh, uh, barring some unforeseen circumstance, to continue uh, walking with us, leading us as bishop for the next five years. At that five-year mark, she is going to begin a process of discernment with diocesan leadership, with the parishes around the diocese, to discern what the future holds, whether that is a uh, beginning to think about a process of transition to calling of the next bishop or uh, maintaining her position as our bishop for uh, a few years after that. Um, so we will see in that sort of uh, five-year time what that will look like. But uh, as of right now, she is committing to uh, continuing on as our bishop for the next five years. And so we celebrate that. We continue to lift her up in our prayers as she guides us and leads us in the ways that she does. So we, uh, we had a very uh, profound and, and joyous time together yesterday and uh, had several things great uh, conversation that we will be talking about soon. Now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God.
understand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation and the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with the blessed Virgin Mary, Saint Anne, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, 
and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. For those of you who are worshiping with us from home, let us pray together. Dear Lord, help me to remember past celebrations of your Eucharistic feast. Reanimate in me the feelings and desires that make this experience a sacred and abiding one.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with the spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And for those of you who are joining with us from home, I invite you to pray with me. God of truth and love, we thank you for this act of spiritual communion. Even as we long for the days of gathering in community to partake of your body and blood, renew in us that which bonds us together, our faith and trust in you, so that we may be transformed and grow in faith and love of you. Amen. And I invite all of us now to profess our mission as we declare together. As a community of faith, let us go forward to bring others to Christ through worship, witness, and love for one another and our neighbor. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and to remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ.